thing that uh, the new drug seems like uh, the most efficient and important drug uh, for the patient. Uh, even though uh, people may find a different way of lowering the time of uh, recovery drug use, I already found that it's another way different way of uh, making it a, a lunch time or a response to two hours of drinking and so on. And so it's very much a good uh, There are speakers at a strong working IT lab since 2011, or since 2007, and they've been very established academic and speaker. They wrote a series, Teaching, Learning, Sports Science. Sean has developed two specialisms in a range of topics, including youth work practice, child living group study, children and life, globalization, youth work history, and contemporary youth politics. And Sean's talk today will be titled Father Group, Understanding Police Space encounters in Southern Senegal. Sean's talk will explore if it is possible to bring youth who are hidden to be identified as the most <coughs> social in youth. It seeks to raise and strong a sociological understanding of youth that characterizes young people as either a form of cultural assassination, distance, or these life vectors that could be fragmented, structuring transition to very poverty. Sean, you're very welcome. being at home, we have the boomerang generation, we have the DIY generation. I could go on and list all of the failed transitions and failed sort of formative nature of growing up. And maybe we should just chuck the whole idea of transition theory away. And I'm trying to suggest that maybe that's where we go next. Um, also, the other way of looking at youth is through youth culture. And again, moral panics, Stanley Cohen's work, uh, the whole legacy around young people that have that expressed in this resistance against society tag it onto their class identity, tag it onto their ethnicity, their race, their gender. Maybe, just maybe, we should also think, well, what's the purpose of all of that? Where does it get us? We seem to be in an ever, never ending cycle of trying to explain why young people <coughs> resist, rebel. I've written about the 2011 riots, looked at the consequences and implications for those things. Stuart Hall, if he was here, would talk about resistance and, re and, and rebellion and has done that for 20, 30 years. Enough is what I'm saying today, really. Let's try and understand young people's lives and the context of their lives for their complexity, their, uh, their, their difficulties, their, in, their inability to understand them is actually the essence of understanding youth because it is an ever-changing, ever-present, and the whole nature of it. And the idea of assemblage, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but Deleuze and, and Guattieri's idea of this idea of this flux, this 
lines of flight, this idea that understanding what it means to be ever present in total existence isn't something we can actually capture. And we shouldn't pretend to be a social scientist, something we can capture, put into a book chapter, understand, and then replicate. The whole point is it's the moment, it's about time and space. It's about understanding encounters, and today I'm going to talk about police encounters with young people. But that moment in time, what is actually going on? And that's all it means, okay? So after today, go on, see young people hanging around outside chip shops with hoodies, looking for jobs, on the Erasmus programs, whatever they're doing. That, what I've taught you today is, is useful, but it's insignificant in terms of understanding the next phenomenon that you will come across. It's hard to do that because we have a legacy and I want to build a career, I want to become a professor based upon my esteemed knowledge. But the whole point about institutional talk this morning is that maybe we should knock those walls down and stop trying to pretend that we're the academics, we're the experts, come to me, I will help you solve your problems of knife crime, etc. So today's talk does come back to some of the points that we've seen um, in the news this morning about calls again for more stop and search. Increasing the powers, increasing the Section 60 powers in the UK, which means that the police can stop anybody, anytime, for a particular lo location that's been defined by a magistrate or a chief police officer with no justifications at all. Where does that leave young people on the margins of society? So it's about police, youth, and space. Within that context, of it being not, not a, a, a defining of youth, but about defining of a particular encounter. Uh, I'm going to draw upon. Um, uh, I can't really pronounce his name, I'm sorry, Leif Burr, French Marxist, um, who's talked about this idea of spatial uh, specialization. Um, and you may have already heard of Pierre Bourdon, Habitus. I'm not sure they're different, personally. Again, it's about enclaves, and I think they're a very similar thing. I really love a similar thing. Social reproduction, okay, and the importance of how social space, social scientists' understanding of how society places, places, how they inform, define, etc., shape who we are. That tagged along with policing practice, for me, presents a major difficulty for young people who don't have a voice. And I think that's, oops, sorry, I've got that line, sorry. And then there's an old concept, which I want to hold on to because it's significant in terms of understanding the marginalization itself. And the reason I've come up with the title bothered, and it's a bit clunky, I appreciate, but it comes from the idea of othering and other. Okay, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but that concept of being the other, the outsider, and we can use different sort of sociological understandings of what that means. That applied to youth in a different context. I'm saying that the police bother young people. I'm saying that adults bother young people. I'm saying that shop owners bother young people. I'm saying that anybody who wants to impose their power over and above another person, in this case a young person, is bothering. The concept has been applied to mothers, mothering, and I've drawn, I've stolen the idea from that when I did the reading. So mothering is a concept about motherhood, mother tongue, the nature of how the implications that are rolled into becoming or being a mother are all facile, but actually they're everything and nothing at the same time. And how women are kind of then constrained or, or defined or their performativity is assessed through their ability to be the mother, the ideal mother, and all the consequences that come from that. So bothering is the same thing. Young people come into those scenarios, into that bothered state, uh, have bothered youth, and, and in that moment, they're struggling to understand what, what, what it means. Uh, uh, and I'm talking more about agency as we get to that later on. Um, and essentially, I've chosen Stop and Search for my book chapter as a, a kind of a case study uh, as in bit research. It was around Stop and Search data, I was looking at some of the figures and public policy around those aspects, and it's in there. But I would suggest that this concept of bothering can apply to any situational encounter where there's an inequality in power between authority figures and it could be parents child it could be teacher child it could be any any aspect but bothering is an inequity within power constraints and how somebody will use and impress upon another person what is expected in terms of um, how they uh, how they should conduct themselves um, and I'll say a bit more about that sorry that's my introduction I'm going to walk about it folks I'm sorry I was talking about it in that but uh, I don't want to sit down on a lecture, so I'll just put this slide up there. First of all, the definition, the term Bobby Jude focuses particularly on the margins. You can't be necessarily out an outsider, or you can't be othered, uh, in a sense, unless you are on the edge to some extent, or seem to be on the edge. Um, and I don't call upon classic sociological theories, but we, we, we have 
um, Robert Merton, and we have other sort of constructs to, to, to draw upon. I'm taking us away from that. That, isn't, that doesn't explain it. That just explains the scenario, the situation that we're in. Uh, but essentially, the police and young people are subject to and can't get away from. Today's story is about knife crime, the concerns about knife crime, the demands from uh, chief of police for more stop and searches, the demands from the police using young people and, and, and the 64 people that have died, 64 people that have died through knife crimes in the, in the last 12 months, using them as a tool to get more funding, to increase the police numbers, is disgusting. Um, and I think we need to be brought, brought to account because most of the problems that young people encounter and most of the consequences of feeling unsafe in the streets, I would argue, are because of what I've called bothering. Young people aren't, don't feel safe. And therefore, to carry a knife is a, is a consequence of the state of play for young people. Um, Another definition in a similar way, but essentially, yes, it's it's about bothering. It's about young people's being told or being uh, 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 being uh, sorry it's ways of seeing young people, which is kind of prescribing or defining what is appropriateness, what is uh, ways of being. Young people grow up through development stages. The key central parts is that they need to find an identity, find a sense of belonging, find a way into society. And part of that is through them developing a sense of belonging. We could call it youth cultures, we have in the past, we call it subculture, subculture theory. I think those theories sit within this, what I would call kind of structured understanding of society. I'm trying to not wash them away, but let's put them into a contemporary context. Young people's lives, contemporary society, 21st century, is so much more complex to grow up in than it ever was for, for me in my generation, only a few decades ago. The marginalization uh, is, a, is a consequence of those things. I've chosen police, youth, space. I could have put teachers, youth, space. I could have used other words to describe it. But essentially, there's a lot of really useful, and again, I'm stealing, I don't really mind stealing, criminological theories. It's a kind of multidisciplinary attitude towards this. Identity formation, research around criminologists is fabulous to use. Uh, and I've done loads and loads of understanding around what do we mean, what is deviancy, why do young people offend, why do we commit crime, etc. Uh, but it doesn't seem to go anywhere. It just explains a particular sort of phenomenon around deviancy and criminality. Um, what I see as, as, a, as a youth worker, as a, as a youth studies uh, uh, academic, young people develop this sense of emotional well-being, ties, connections with their communities and their sense of where they come from. Uh, and the police disrupt that state of development in terms of the child's identity to me is quite consequential and damaging for, 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 for young people growing up in society. And I think the consequence of that is children, young people carrying knives uh, and feeling unsafe because they feel they're living in a, a marginalized state. Um, and stop and search to me is, a, is an absolute classic example. There hasn't been, it's difficult to do research, isn't it? There's some people have gone in, sat in police cars and watched them conduct, but we all know about the nature of uh, being in a research environment and the behavior. And there are videos that you can get and watch young people, uh, sorry, watch um, police officers driving around on their parole patrol and how they conduct themselves. But clearly it's not, it's not really to be seen as being adequate scientific research. I'm gonna try and click on this link. What I've got is a little link, and there's quite a few bits on YouTube, and I'll talk a little bit more about later on about why I've chosen this particular one uh, when I come to sort of some of the conclusions around. Uh, oh, is that too loud? <laughs> I'm going to start, start this out at the beginning. Somebody's filmed this. This is YouTube. This is citizen journalism, whatever you want to call it. This is real people doing real stuff. Um, but we can capture a glimpse. And they've gone and filmed. The police are in central London. They stopped a group, and I won't say anymore, a group of young men. Uh, quite young, young people. 12, I think, the youngest is. Up to about 16. School age. School children, effectively. have been stopped in the middle of London by a huge number of police officers, to me a disproportionate number of police officers. We're talking about police time, resourcing, lack of resourcing. A lot of police have invested a lot of time for this 20, 30 minute stop and search. Uh, I'll show you the beginning and I'll show you the end because I haven't got time to show the 10 minutes. So let's just watch the encounter. I'm the, I'm the Sorry, how do I get it out of the screen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it doing? Yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, so I just wanted to show you the beginning of this encounter. Um, I'll try and fill in the gaps of needs, but you can't see straight away what's going on, who's being stopped and why they're being stopped, and how they're being stopped, and how they're being informed about why they're being stopped, and etc. And then the person on the phone, who's a, a, a young man, who on videos of being in later on, talks, videos it, and tries to intervene and give some sort of uh, children's <coughs> rights advice, I would call it, or some sort of rights on their legal rights to not uh, engage with the police, because it's inappropriate or checking things out. It's just quite interesting. <laughs> Sometimes your camera doesn't work. You don't need to tell him nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. I go to thesuperbarschool.org. So we can do our stuff, no problem. Alright? Do you mind if you send me a film in there? Do you mind if you hold it? You don't need to ask him that. That's not your business to ask him that. You can ask him that. So don't give no details then. Tell him you've got all your parents. So don't give no details. No. Sorry. Well, it is worth watching, and there's quite a lot of YouTube that are worth watching. Obviously, you've seen all the young people who have been stopped are black young men in London, African like Caribbean uh, 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 heritage. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, I'm going to show it a bit later on at the end. There's actually a white young man who was part of the friendship group who turned up at the scene at the same time, but the police let him walk on. And it turns out later on, and I may have well shown it because of the time, but it turns out later on he had a knife. He was carrying a knife, the white young lad. And these lot then later on, as they get through to the dialogue, they try and explain to the police that well, why, do you, why do you stop? Why do you stop the other person? The guy with the camera starts to say, why do you stop that other guy? And what is it because he was white? And again, we get into that dialogue. So straight away, you've seen who are the people that have been identified here as the problem, the problem orientated policing, trying to protect the young person from being filmed by somebody who's trying to protect the young person from the police. It was quite an interesting dialogue to me that was going on. Um, yeah, little scenarios I haven't done. I, I can't do research into this thing now. But YouTube gives us a little bit of that as we get better at using social media. Maybe we can explore this further. Um, the point is, the police is over policing, under protection. Um, it's categorising certain groups of young people who are seen to be uh, problematic. Sorry. Um, and it links this idea that then young people, you don't have to carry it on, it, it, just, it kind of makes you feel really sad. The young lad who was there on the post eventually gets, gets almost, not strip searched, because not allowed to, but takes his bag off, they go through his bag, take his coat off, go through his coat, take his top off, they skim down to 12 years old. And the other kids have got the same treatment. At the end, the video of the testimony, well, have you all been stopped? And it goes around and they all say, yeah, well, they've been stopped and searched. The group of young people, and then the justification is that somebody has seen somebody uh, somebody reported somebody uh, attempted to steal a bag, and these end up being the culprits that, that we end up with. This is stigmatisation, marginalisation. Uh, we talked this morning about sort of <laughs> uh, forms of oppression. These young people are seen to be, it's acceptable for them to be stopped. Whether, whether the individual presented it in terms of um, Goffman's ideas, or whether they, the police themselves decided that certain people can be stopped with, with impunity to them as an individual. The person with the camera is now raising questions about that, and I'll show later on how more and more of this filming, people filming their encounters with the police is actually problematic for the police, and maybe how they go about conducting uh, themselves, particularly to do with young people. Um, 
Uh, sorry, other than just a bit of theoretical stuff, I suppose, check a little bit more theory. See, Monty Bubba's idea has been around for a long time. 1907 is the publication of a particular book. 1950s, somebody will correct me. Uh, a long time ago, the idea of uh, the second sex and the beginning of sort of the second wave of, of, uh, 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 of feminist theory <coughs> in the 70s kind of emerged and rolled forward from that understanding. Same idea applies to states work around Orientalism, colonialism, and it's kind of got the race uh, sections within it. And we can talk, uh, we have been this morning, about Irish history uh, and a particular colonialization of the island of Ireland uh, over, over years gone by, and how the notion of white Irishness uh, has kind of got its own massive uh, historical sort of legacy uh, that I live with and encounter, I have encountered in my life as a second generation person growing up. Uh, in, 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 on the island of uh, uh, England, the United Kingdom. Uh, but the sense is that people are othered. They are less significant. They are second-class citizens, and therefore they are subject to a second-class treatment service from top to bottom by the institutions that, that, that will deal with those things. I could explore that further. Others have done it better than me. The point I'm trying to make is that's a framework we can work within. I'm interested in more of the encounters. There's lines of flight. How do you people respond to those situations? Picking up a camera, a, 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 having a smartphone and being able to record your encounters with authority figures is kind of one way of rebooting, of re, re, um, rebuking uh, what's going on and it's more and more common nowadays. Um, I think it's important to understand and broader sense this idea of lived experiences. This space, I think Americans call it spatialization. I'm not quite sure how I like the term, but yeah. This idea of social space having meaning, irrespective of humans. Part of my thinking about moving theory around youth on is to not just look at it as if it's a humanistic kind of like uh, theory and philosophy. Young people are just part and parcel, we're all part and parcel of comings and goings and, and transitions between times and place and space. Uh, and I think uh, at least I was brilliant for that in terms of understanding what he called the representations of space um, and this idea of reproduction of uh, social sort of uh, forms and, 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 and notions of how we live within those places and spaces. I think Bordeaux does it the same thing. Happy this is more common, I would say. People come up to Pierre Bordeaux's work. Whatever reason, one seems to have got ahead of the other. Um, but the young people who are developing a sense of identity that I talked about, a sense of belonging, trying to find their place in society, community is everything for them. If anybody who does a youth work, community work, work within those settings. Anybody who comes from a disadvantaged community, all the research we have around sort of crime, uh, inner city crime, the reason for people getting involved in gangs, I would say the fundamental sort of common denominator is social deprivation. Living with, in, living with limited means, you have to make do. If that means that you end up getting into a cycle where you uh, buy products that are stolen in order to survive. I had a story taken a student in class when I did this lecture, in, a similar lecture in the class, and she said, she laughed and said, uh, it's really funny when you're saying that. I remember being at home, it's quite recently, she's an 18 year old student. I remember being at home and the next door neighbor, somebody down the road would come into our house. He'd put a little thing through the letterbox and say, 20 pound, anything from Superdrug, write it on and I'll get it for you. So they did a list of shopping list for Superdrug, guaranteed to give the person 20 pound. He went shoplifting and comes back. Okay, it's a means to an end, it makes a living. It's a different world, but people who have little means find a way of surviving, and it's a sense of trying to deal with the probation. Then you get the added on, this idea of surrogate families, gangs, being part of a gang, carrying a weapon, stop looking after yourself, being worried about you not being protected by the people that should be protecting you, not being given a guarantee of progression into adulthood and secure jobs in the future. You don't have a stake in society. We used to call it the social contract between welfare and the state. It's now become disaggregated, fragmented. It's now meaningless, effectively. For my children, I mean, now middle class. I grew up in a working class environment, now middle class. My children have gone to university. They are coming out, and my son's on a zero contracts. Others have got nothing to look forward to. How on earth could you get a start in, in advanced capitalist societies? Uh, but for young people, they need that little bubble of space. And I'm arguing that the police, the encroachment of these types of services is reducing, taking away fundamentally those uh, uh, spaces for young people uh, to breathe. Um, and I'll talk about how we resolve that later on. So for me, policing is, as Lee would call it, a spatial practice. It conducts, it constricts, it defines who, what, where, when is allowed to walk through those spaces. Who got stopped in the square in London was determined by the police officers on that day. It happened to 
to be a large group of uh, black young men walking through who looked to me like school students of a, of, a, of a normal age who were just doing a normal thing of going from A to B. But for some reason that space became mediated by this discourse around problem youth or knife crime and we're going to stop. And I haven't even done the figures and the, the figures on stop and search and the disproportionality and all the other things that are in the chapter because it's so obvious that it's, 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 uh, it's, it's targeted at young people particularly, particularly black young men seven times now, used to be 26 times more likely to stop and search in early 2009. Theresa May came in and kind of clamped it all down and put some uh, things in place, but it's still a disproportionate and it's still an ineffective form of police. I can't even give you the figures. Section 60 figures from a chapter is something like 0.3% of the, of the 40,000 stop and searches under Section 60 with no ground, resulting in an arrest of any form. 0.39% was the figures I worked out as. And for stop and search, where you've got a reason, justified reason for stop and searching, I think there's one point something million, but one million stop and searches. I think the figure's something like 7%, arrests 10%, maybe. So one in 10, that's, a, that's 100,000, 100,000, whatever it is, 10,000 people of the 100,000, so 100,000 of the million are stopped. So a million people's lives are disrupted and we get 10% success rate. I'm not sure that's acceptable, with, along with the inequalities that come along with it. Growing up in poverty, poor areas, there's even a greater need, you could say. Children's rights would suggest there's a greater need for the vulnerable groups in society, the poor, working class communities that exist through poverty and isolation and dislocation. Uh, and Mark, sorry, Rob McDonald um, and Jane Marsh and Shilgrim and others up at Teesside have spent lots of time looking at uh, the particular phenomenon around deprivation and, 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 and um, uh, sorry, also a disconnected youth has a kind of construct in its own right. Others talk about the transitions that we kind of see as if this is the model as ragged transitions. And I like the idea of ragged transitions from Loda because it takes us back to continuity. This isn't a new phenomenon. People haven't just become poor. People have always grappled with poverty. Ragged transitions, ragged schooling takes us way, way back in Western youth history, back to the beginning of the uh, 19th century when philanthropists came together and tried to address the issues around young people, illiteracy, um, uh, sexual impropriety, um, and um, wasted straits on the street, pilfering pickpockets. The magistrate solution was trying to put in place certain <coughs> codes of conduct. This isn't a new phenomenon. Stop and search is just the modern day equivalent of other forms and techniques. And what we haven't done as youth theorists or, or, or academics or practitioners We've spent too much time talking about culture, transition theory, and what's gone wrong, and where did the policy not go right? Actually, what we need to talk about, this is in its own right, is a phenomenon of the day, and we can find continuities and discontinuities in terms of the, tech, the, the groups involved, who are the new migrants, who are the people who have been stopped and searched, who will be the next group who have stopped and searched. And I don't think we can find the answers. I think we can start to recognize that this is um, uh, have a dysfunctional way of supporting vulnerable, children and families, um, and we need to find alternative solutions. And the same other theory, which again, I don't know if you've come across, Peter Kelly, Australia. Australia is, if anybody hasn't done anything around youth uh, in terms of recent stuff, you, Australia is kind of massively ahead, believe it or not, and there's probably reasons why, but in terms of youth studies, contemporary youth theory, critical youth studies, and America, Canada, sorry, not America, Canada and Australia seem to be reaching out into this idea of what I'm talking about, about some assemblage, this idea of that, this isn't about this structured idea of inequality and how it's replicated. It's much more complex than that. Young people will, in one scenario, be stopped and searched by the police, and in another scenario, probably excel in other aspects of their lives. We need to understand the dynamics and the complexity and not try to come up with a prescribed understanding. Because I, I would only say, the time you've written a book, a publication on it, the phenomenon's moved on and you've kind of missed the train in the sense of understanding. The reality. I don't think we should be here trying to proclaim to have the answers to these problems. It's just to raise that understanding. What's happening with the young people then, in terms of Kelly's idea of this, and John Muncy, Prime and Youth, talked about the same thing, the criminalization of youth, the generation of young people who have been drawn into the system, uh, targeted for particular types of attention. If anybody does anything about youth at risk, the current agenda around young people in society, schools, so much to do them sadly. Schools have tracked and monitored young people now for the best part of all my children's lives, 20 year old, 
Uh, the constant attendance, performance, are you above, are you below the threshold rate? Do you, are you going to achieve, are you going to sit, are you going to be five or eight to six or whatever you guys call it now, progression nine or whatever it is. We've got these targets. Teachers have been under performativity. Uh, universities, we're here now. I don't know what it's like in Limerick. Hope it's not half as bad as it is in Teesside. Attendance monitoring. Students have been called into a question whether they're actually engaging with the subject, being called questions about their competences as undergraduate students, even though all the risk has gone from the state in our case to the individual, uh, and the same with school students and have a very expectation. This public gaze, this young people at risk, concerns, targeted, it's kind of led to this idea of a generation of young people who we mistrust, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't see them in the future. Uh, and it isn't all young people, obviously, the ones who have done well will probably carry on doing well. But now, I think we're reaching a stage in our understanding of social theory, is that this group of people, and I don't know how big it is, there have been some researches, but as a group of young people, the disenfranchised, the disengaged, whatever word people want to label them with, who we can now jettison. And I think effectively we're reaching a point where these no longer figure. They don't have rights, they don't have the entitlements, they can't raise questions about the police stopping and searching them. School policies around kids who don't sit GCSE. Now, nobody talks about it. It's not about league tables and how well you're doing. How many students are denied the right to sit at GCSE because they're not going to pass? Shocking phenomenon that goes on. Hidden phenomenon that goes on. This is the relatively hidden phenomenon. I think I'm bringing it alive with the YouTube videos. Loda has a beautiful quote. I think it speaks for itself. I'll let you read it. looking at young people, looking at young people who are engaging with the police, very critical, obviously, of the police. To me, it hits the nail right on the head. I've stole the quote from another person who cited it in another thing, but it's worthy of a, a, a second, a second uh, outing in my chapter. I think it just gets to the essence of the issue. Every stop, every search, every arrest, it has that, it sets the messages out. It's a spatial practice. It tells children, young people, adults, and we've had it for years, and I've talked in the chapter about this idea of policing as missionaries. Way back to the beginning of the police formation of police in England uh, and Wales many decades ago, a couple of centuries ago, the idea was that they had this role to keep an eye on the drunkards. And you can imagine all the people who removed over the years who've come into the English towns and cities. Uh, and there's loads of uh, beautiful stuff by Storch, I've used in the chapter, of the parish council records and the people who have been picked up for drunkenness. And it's the usual suspects, and it began way, way, way back. And now we've got to the point now where young people are the kind of, to me, the core focus of attention because they're not going to succeed or move on, or there aren't any jobs to move them into. We don't need to, we don't need, can, we don't need factory fodder anymore. We don't need young people to go into zero-hour contracts. We can get enough people from other parts of the world to come and supplement those things who are not young, um, who are old enough, and probably got other responsibilities. What Ralph's talked about in the criminologist, the idea of this permanent suspect. Once you're part of uh, a group, those 12 young lads who are seen there in the square are police property. They become the, the gaze of attention is focused upon them. They become the permanent suspect, or what does use the word the usual suspect. We've seen it in other scenarios to do with Irish, uh, Irish terrorism, uh, some of the civil rights cases that are still going on to this day of the usual suspect being lined up and taken through the systems and that. The riots of 2011 is a classic example. 3,000 people after the riots of 11 were arrested and prosecuted. 70% uh, of them were under 21. Only 30% were younger than, I think, 18. But you can get as they're all youngsters. But 75% of them have previous criminal convictions. It suggests that these are the people that we need to arrest because these are the ones that committed the crimes. Anybody who sat through or observed the four days of those looting and rioting in London, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, uh, Bristol, it wasn't just young people that were pulled up in four by fours, opening the doors, getting the dresses out of debutants and etc. What I saw, everybody was taking them down to the police work, policing. But the people who were arrested, the 3,000, if you look at the figures, that's all they did. The courts had 24 7, if you remember, this rolling judicial system kicked in. Young people, predominantly poor, working class, 
young people, predominantly black, very important type of thing, but black young men as well. It's a constant kind of like idea. But nobody back an eyelid. It was kind of like the moral panic was over. We can all go back and sleep safely in our beds. Um, but in the meantime, the same group of people have kind of been uh, categorized in that manner. Okay, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit there. How much time have I got? I'm rabbiting on. Sorry. Uh, I'm kind of there, Rich, aren't I? Right, okay, last thing I want to say then about bothered youth, because I'm trying to take it outside of this structure agency, and I've talked about it, is that reject this dualistic notion of structure society and the age of the individual. I think we need to move, it's more fluid than that. There's times when you have the ability to inform, construct, co construct develop your own sense of identity, you achieve things through your own efforts. Other times you're on the slipstream and you manage to be in the right place at the right time, or whether it's your class, we talked this morning about privilege and class or uh, ethnicity and uh, how that can or can't uh, help. It's a fluid thing, but research tells us that young people aren't just victimized. Okay, I painted a picture there about young people there. Gray's and Manny talks about being like knowing agents. They subvert as and when, which is why I think the phenomenon of looking at it as if it's not just victims and, and people who are uh, on the other side of that scenario. Young people subvert, convert, play with the regulations. We've all heard of stories about the old days of joyriders getting a chase from the police, people bringing up 999 for the battery beginning to throw bricks at them. I'm not condoning these things, but it's a bit, there's nothing else to do. And the ride 2011, there's nothing else to do on a Sunday afternoon and a hot summer day. Why not? have a little go at somebody or other and cause a little bit of disruption. And when the police are engaging with young people, I think the research they found is children looked after, treat the police as a taxi service to get them back home after they've gone and done or ran away and done whatever they've done. That's not them being victims, that's them playing the system. Others do it. Kids are excluded from school. We all know the young people, if you work with them, who know how to manipulate, play the system. Uh, I'm not even talking about whether we should condone that or not and say there's a reality that young people aren't just oppressed uh, in their own right. And the more we can learn about that, the more we might be able to understand some of the solutions to some of the ways forward in terms of recognising that young people maybe are part of the problem, but they're certainly part of the solution as well. Uh, I don't know how much time to show you that. Sorry, folks. <laughs> uh, a similar sort of point. Evans talked about bounded agency. How your time, your location and place, social class particularly, uh, but also ethnicity and gender can impose some limitations upon there. But within that restricted space, young people can exhibit and demonstrate ways in which they can start to alter or influence. So in a sense, I'm trying to, give in, I'm trying to see young people as having a little bit of a way out as well, a little bit of a contribution to how we understand this problem. They aren't just innocent victims and never we sort of clamp down upon police practices but maybe we need to understand how we can work, collaborate, uh, and understand young people's participation in some of these things. And I'm gonna leave the slide for time, sorry, it's the same kind of thing again. Young people should be part of the co-construction uh, of, of the solutions. Finally, I think two things that are useful to draw upon. Research into understanding young people's lives, I think, and I didn't, it's only recently I've read this there, I didn't know this existed. I came across it, but as a youth worker, talking to my staff when I manage youth centers, what we started to recognise is just from practice talk, and we didn't do research, and we didn't have the academic flat caps and whatever we wear to sort of stand up for it. Critical, young people come to you to work when they need you, and it's critical points in their life. They've been, they've been they've run away from home, they've been kicked out, they've become pregnant, um, have kids who've come, got addicted to drugs, spent all the money, they've got a gambling addiction. You know these young people, I've seen them week in, week out over many years, suddenly something happens in their life and they'll walk into the youth centre and they will tell you about it. Maybe not at the seven o'clock in the afternoon, in the evening, they get half past nine when you try to shut the shutters, but they'll come and tell you and we have to be there to respond. And I would say that's the problem with today in the island slide, but in the UK, the austerity cuts, the loss of youth services, we've lost this safety net uh, of people that what me and my staff were doing for a long time. Getting paid not very well to work on social hours, you know, it wasn't like it was a glamorous job. Sessional youth work, two and a half hours a week on eight pound an hour or ten pound an hour, um, is not a great job. <laughs> but what the academics here recognise, and I'll pass it that they have through crim work around criminology, is that these critical moments exist in young people's lives, and academic study shows that actually we need to be better. The police, particularly, but all the social agencies, need to be better at identifying these things. 
And what we should certainly not be doing is talk about criminalization, stigmatization. We need to do completely the opposite. We need to stop these people being drawn into the systems. I can give you examples upon examples of young people who've come, complex lives, excluded from school, mums kicked them out, they've got ADHD. Uh, all these things are going on, and each person in each location that they're going to, each social encounter, is trying to address their educational needs, their, their social behavior, their home life, but nobody's joining the dots and needs agencies to be able to have that approach. Once you start putting them into one of those other systems and they become targeted at that risk, they then get the enforced treatments or whatever, but then they're labeled stigmatized. 75% of uh, first offenders reoffend within the following year. It tells you that the systems uh, around criminalization don't actually work. Uh, so, and any the other thing, research is telling us, Thompson, uh, Maya Kelly, other people, youth, uh, youth services are the harbors in the storm. In times of austerity, severe cuts down the public services, young people's vulnerabilities, not knowing what the future will become. We need more. You hear me today, today in the news, we talked about knife crime. The um, Lord, the Lord Mayor, <laughs> the Mayor of London said exactly these things. Labour politicians are coming out today and saying, we need more youth services. After 2011 riots in London and across England, we need more youth services. London and Tottenham got more money for youth services after the riots. Do we need to allow riots to happen? Do we need to allow knife crime stabbings to happen before <coughs> we invest in youth provision? Uh, to provide this, what I would call this safety net, to catch the critical moments and incidents and be there to help young people turn their lives around? Or do we wait for them to be incarcerated, excluded from school, and all the cost and damage that that causes to individual lives? Sorry, that's my bit of a rant, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>